Sometime the following morning, Taritha awoke to the unsettling sound of silence. She stared up at the heavy beams and planks of her new ceiling, feeling a wave of vertigo as she tried to recall where she was. For the first time in her life, she had woken up in an unfamiliar place. As she shifted, the magical mattress adjusted beneath her and the memories flooded back. She was in the mage's extraordinary factory fortress palace. She lived here now. A smile spread across her lips at the thought. Understanding the bed's quirks now, it no longer bothered her. She got up confidently to start her day, instinctively ducking her head as she had in her old hovel. Straightening up, she noted that even if she jumped, her fingertips wouldn't reach the beams above. Taking in her sparse surroundings, her problems presented themselves. She couldn't wash without warm water. She had no fire to heat the water. She also didn't have any water. There's warm water in the dining hall, down on the first floor on the opposite corner of the huge building. She sighed with resignation, so far away. The young herbalist put on her official White Flame Industries skirt and blouse, shaking out the wrinkles. As she slipped it on, a thought crept into her mind. It seemed like she'd overlooked the whole reason for the factory. What if she didn't have to go herself? Do the imps have a maximum range? She invoked her imps, directed them to don their dresses and hats, then commanded, Lady Bluebird, go to the kitchen and fetch me a large mug of hot water. Her voice trembled a bit, unsure if she was doing it right or inviting fresh disaster. Merp, the tiny imp in a blue dress confirmed. It tugged the heavy bedroom door to no avail. Teresa pulled it open a crack, and the hellspawn squeezed out to bound down the hallway and out of sight. While she waited for it to return, she emptied out her family's ancient iron cookpot to use as a wash basin. It was mostly clean, even if it smelled of a thousand meals and was a bit sooty. She scarcely had it empty when her imp returned, a gorgeous iridescent mug of water held high over its sun-hatted head, trailing steam behind it. The little monster placed it on the floor in front of her and stood with its sisters in a row. Truly a magical place the water runs. She dabbed one of her old raggy washcloths into the hot water to wash her face, neck and arms. Seeing the used water in the wash basin, another problem occurred to her. She couldn't just fling it into the woods, not without a long walk. But this problem was just the mirror image of her first problem. Lady Crossbill and Miss Goldfinch dump this water down the latrines and then clean the pot and return it to the room. The red and yellow dressed imps murped in unison and sprinted away with the wide iron pot, not spilling anything despite their speed. Come, Lady Bluebird, it's time for breakfast. She walked the halls with a new perspective. It might be just that she was better rested. It might be that her first two real imp tasks worked perfectly, but she could feel her misgivings fade already. It was exactly like she imagined nobles lived. One just says one's wants out loud, and it becomes someone else's problem. She used to think it was unfair, but now that she saw the other side of it, there was definitely some merit to the system. Besides, based on what Mage Thippoli said, it wasn't like the imps were even aware that they were serving, so it was no hardship to them. She could smell breakfast as she came down the stairs. More accurately, a lord's breakfast. Instead of porridge, she could smell bacon and eggs and fresh buns. As she came around the corner, she stopped in involuntary panic, seeing that the counter crawled with tiny imps, darting about and wielding knives and spatulas as big as they were. Of course, who else would make the meals here? Some imps stood on the cooktop, entirely unaffected by the sizzling eggs on either side of their hooves, while others sliced fruit and veggies with phenomenal precision. Morning, Teresa. Hungry? How about a bit of everything? Clive grinned. He wore an apron while ordering imps about the kitchen. He held a wooden spoon like a marshal's baton. There were far more imps than his three, but he commanded them all. Uh, sure. She was badly overwhelmed but hungry. 
There were a few of the guards at a table, but none of the directors were to be seen. She overcame her shyness to sit with them beside Jorgen. "'Good morning, miss. How was your sleep?' he asked cheerfully. "'Took me a few tries to figure out the magic bed, but once I got that sorted, I don't think there's even a comparison. I slept so well, and I feel great today.' Good. I'm glad you got it. Theros slept on the floor last night. Superstitious ninny. Theros rolled his eyes and raised his hands in frustration. Damn it. You don't have to tell everyone about that. Also, I'm not superstitious. It's just that the thing moved. I had no way of knowing it was safe. There's demons here, you know. He hissed the last bit, as if he was worried that the demons were listening. Ah, sure. Not everyone has the courage of a peasant girl, Jorgen asserted as he ate a thick slice of bacon. No offence, miss. I bet I face more scary things in a week than you lot do in a month. You should aspire to be as brave as a peasant girl, she retorted with a smile. She wasn't actually offended, but it was important not to let things slide. She leaned over to whisper to her imp what kind of tea she'd like and smiled even wider as it darted into the chaotic kitchen. Aye, my blood would run cold if I had to deal with sick wee ones and dying old ones. I see you're already getting the hang of these imps. I think Lord Thippoli was too modest. They are way better than he let on, the burly guard said. Mage Thippoli, Teresa corrected. Might be Mage Lord now. He owns productive lands now, don't he? Ricard asked between bites of eggs covered with creamy dill sauce. Might be Archmage, Lord. I bet he's better at magic than any of them back at the mainland, Theros speculated. Those terms have definitions he doesn't meet, and that's a poor way to speak of your betters. Somehow, Ethlina was standing behind them. Her tone was icy, which wasn't unusual for her. I have business at the sawmill. Two of you will accompany me. At once, milady. Jürgen said, bowing deeply while wiping his face on his napkin. He smacked Theros on the shoulder as he rose. Just a moment for us to get our armor on. The two men jogged out of the dining hall to the armory. The elf perched beside Taritha, her feet on the seat with her hands behind her back. It looked natural enough when she did it, but Taritha couldn't even imagine sitting in that posture. The mysterious elf was wearing a stately flowing robe with the hood down, her plumage and narrow neck marking her inhuman heritage. The lighting was good enough for Taritha to see she was entirely covered in a nearly invisible fine downy fur. The conversation was entirely stopped as all the humans became intensely interested in their plates, avoiding eye contact. The silence stretched and grew. So... What are the requirements of those titles, Ethlina? Taritha finally asked. In a society where forms of address and titles were the entire basis of one's identity, it was an important question. Calling Ethlina by name was a daring move to assert equality. Taritha blushed immediately, wondering if demons were already corrupting her manners. Ethlina regarded her for long moments. A lord is nobility, a privilege granted by one's liege, in this case the Duke of Wavegate, which hasn't been granted. The Archmage title is awarded by the College of Magic upon completing ritualized tests, which he hasn't done. She kept her intense gaze on Teresa. In the future, address me as Director of Operations or Director Ethlina. Yes, Director Ethlina. Thank you, Teresa said with a gulp. The silence hung heavy, but the young herbalist was grateful for two imps when they delivered a plate heaped with breakfast. The imps exuded an air of comical authority. They both wore finely tailored miniature coats, complete with brass buttons and tiny cravats. Miniature satchels hung over their shoulders, and wide-brimmed hats, slightly askew, completed their meticulous ensembles, making them look like a caricature of a pair of merchants ready to strike a bargain. The breakfast tasted even better than it smelled, and was her sole focus, anything to distract herself from the LV sitting beside her. Thankfully, her relief came soon, as Ethlina rose. Strive to have a productive day. Ethlina said, her voice cool and distant. 
She glided out the door to the central yard, her preternatural hearing picking up the faint sounds of Jurgen and Theros jogging back from the armory. Clad in full mail and armed, they rushed across the dining hall to catch up to the director. Addressing her by name, I do aspire to your courage, maybe not your recklessness, Ricard whispered once the heavy oak door to the yard shut behind the armoured men. What was I thinking? Light, purify me. At least I lived to tell the tale. She sighed with a bit of a tremble. She finished the rest of her meal and started to clear her dishes. Leave them. That's not people work anymore, Clive called from the kitchen. She stopped. Leaving a mess felt wrong, but she understood the reasoning. With a hurried thanks and a wave, she darted out to the factory floor, where she hoped to find Mage Thippily. She'd assumed her normal lessons were on hold while he ramped up the factory, but knew she ought to double-check. The mage was exactly where she expected to find him, in the centre of his great production floor, surrounded by countless imps. It took her a second to remember that he was in no way limited to three like the rest of them were. It looked like an entire society of imps were darting around him. She stood in awed silence, just watching the spectacle of production. Raw materials eroded before her eyes as they took one plank, one bolt of cloth or cask of linseed oil at a time, as quick as a hen might peck for seeds. The imps themselves were perfectly silent, other than the odd merp, as new commands were issued, but their tools made a jarring racket. There was sawing, planing, hammering, and other actions she couldn't even describe. Oh, good morning, Miss Whitflores. I'll be with you in just a moment, he said distractedly, before giving yet another series of commands to the imps. That's fine. I just wanted to confirm that, she started. I think they've got it now. Let's watch them complete their orders, and we can start today's lessons, the demonologist said, taking off his wireframe glasses to clean the lenses on his shirt sleeve. Teresa noticed sawdust in his hair and beard. The tiny imps began taking raw materials less frequently, while finished goods piled up at the far end of the line. The demonologist was fully focused on their work, so she remained silent, observing him. His lips twitched as if he was about to give new orders, but then relaxed. This happened almost constantly, his eyes darting from one end of the chaos to the other, as alert as a cat watching a squirrel. Once the last dresser was built and stacked with the other furniture, they doubled back. The tiny, and to her eye naked, imps cleaned the entire area, replacing their tools and sitting cross-legged in a neat grid, covering a fair portion of the work area. Perfect! Just as I'd hoped. The mage turned to leave the factory floor and gestured for her to follow. We'll do your lessons in my chambers today. I'll inspect their work later. Oh, all right, we don't. She hustled to catch up with him. Actually, today's lesson will be a short one. I've some field work I'd like you to perform. Demonologist Thippily was more energetic than she'd ever seen him. Gone was the normal weight of introspection and worry. In its place was a tornado of activity. If it wasn't in bad taste given his profession, she'd have even called him a man possessed. So, as you are doubtlessly aware from our earlier discussions on mana field density coefficients, there is usually a slight natural variation, he said as they ascended the steps to the third floor. I, uh, probably, she said. The words were familiar, but didn't connect to any concept in her mind. Anyways, there is a field of mana everywhere, like oxygen in air. And sometimes that mana is slightly more concentrated and slightly less. Again, not that dissimilar to oxygen. He continued as they walked quickly down the third floor hallway to his chambers. Yes, we breathe that, she agreed confidently. I noticed that my imps were moving a bit slower today, which suggests they might be over-consuming local energies. Though powered by hell plane energy, the conduits rely on normal ambient manner. He pushed his door open, revealing his chambers, more than twice the size of Teresa's. 
The room was divided into distinct areas, a sleeping area, a library with a massive desk, and a cozy section with comfortable chairs for entertaining. These spaces were thoughtfully partitioned by plants, bookshelves, and painted room dividers. The room was well lit by a series of narrow windows on the external wall, allowing beams of bright morning light to stream in. It looked centuries old, but smelled of fresh sawdust and linseed oil. This is so nice, it's huge, she exclaimed, taking a seat in an ornate armchair. She ran a finger over the perfect woodwork, wondering if it had been crafted that morning or the night before and I felt guilty about how unreasonably big my room was. Thank you. Don't ever feel bad about that. Now where was I? Ah, yes, I made this, a manometer to measure ambient manner. He held up a short piece of wood with glowing lights on it. The levels are noticeably lower on the factory floor than here. I'd like you to take some readings around town and perhaps into the woods. The more data points, the better. Feel free to assign a guardsman to watch your back if you like. He rummaged through his desk drawers, searching for something. Teresa's ears perked up. This sounded a lot like having authority over the young men she worked with. She'd assumed she was organizationally far junior to them, but had never asked for clarification. Here. He handed her a small blank notebook, a graphite stylus, and the rough-cut piece of wood. Her gaze was drawn to the glowing parts that resembled gems. Its crude appearance stood in stark contrast to everything else she'd come to expect from him. The centermost gem was labelled with an N, a plus sign above, and a minus sign below. The rest were unlabeled, as was the back. It's just a prototype, but I'd like you to note your location and the readings. For instance, if you're at the docks and these all light up, write a docks N plus 6. If two gems below light up, you'd note N2. Got it? Seems simple enough. I haven't calibrated it properly, so any results are valuable, even if they seem useless, the mage explained distractedly. We'll do, she said resolutely. What are the little magic gems made of? They were quite shiny and a soothing green. Just ordinary emeralds. The enchantment is all in the plank. The world spun for a moment as she grasped the staggering value of a dozen cut emeralds of that size. She had no context, but she was sure lords had smaller stones in their swords or scepters. She would definitely be getting an armed escort for this errand. Um, I'll report back when I'm done, she said bravely. Excellent, carry on. He grabbed a handful of books and papers and sat himself at his desk. Teresa went a few doors down to her room to get a sturdy, over-the-shoulder bag for her outing. She sat on her bed, marvelling at the treasure in her hands. It was clear that the mage had crafted it himself, and quickly. There was no consideration beyond function. The top of the wood wasn't even square. Most baffling of all was the incredible wealth of gems, casually attached. Each one was nearly the size of a pea. People died for things a sliver of the value of even one of those. This is by far the most valuable thing these hands have ever held. And he just handed it to me like it was leftover toast. And he made it sound like the emeralds weren't the valuable part of the device. And this bed and the imps would be vastly more valuable yet. She closed her eyes and swallowed slowly. The true nature of the mage's gifts hadn't registered before. Where did she even fit in society anymore? She still felt like a hungry peasant girl from a drafty hovel, but that was at odds with what she held and what she sat on. Most curiously of all, the idea of stealing it didn't even occur to her. The mage's trust had somehow become more valuable than gemstones. Don't just sit there. Be the person he thinks you are. After a slight detour to get her imps to create a simple leather case for the garish instrument, she found Ricard in the armory, unpacking crates of gear from the move. Where is everyone? Is it just you here? she asked. Nah, a normal busy day. Clive's on sentry and Kedril's on gate. The chief and the rest are about town. What's up? he said without stopping his work. 
He was putting gambesons on armor stands that mimicked a man's shoulders, then putting the heavy male hauberks on top. The effect on the few he'd already finished were a lot like a headless armored torso. There were several bare stands still waiting. Great news! Laundry day will have to wait. The mage asked me to take a survey around town and suggested I bring an armed protector, she teased, her voice beaming with over-the-top enthusiasm. Well, if the Lord Archmage said I shouldn't do my chores, that's good enough for me, Taritha, he said with a smile. He stopped unpacking and started donning armor, making a point of getting his employer's title wrong while addressing her by her first name. Unsure how much privacy he needed, she turned her back while he changed. In the future, you will address me as Medic Taritha, she said, with as much faux icy indifference as she could muster. Your ladyship shall have all the respect she deserves. In far less time than she expected, he touched her elbow, ready to proceed. He was in full armor, including a closed helm and the white and purple company tabard. He had a longsword on his hip and a wide shield on his back. It looked like he strode off the cover of a fairy tale book. His mail even sparkled in the flickering lamplight. I feel safer already. She started down the hallway and out of the building. I'm just taking some readings from this new artifact that he made and writing it in the book. They waved to Kedril in the gatehouse as they left. So, why did you want me around? This is your town, and folk here normally seem nice enough, Ricard asked, his voice slightly tinny through his helm. You'll see. Actually, this is probably a fine first reading. They stopped, just a few paces beyond the gate. She pulled out the manometer and saw it was one over normal. Here, hold this. She passed him the gem-encrusted object while she wrote the results in the notebook. Holy balls, are these? He stammered. Oh my no, nothing special, just ordinary emeralds, she said in her best professorial tones. Wow, that makes sense. I see why he'd worry about some new hire running off with this to start her own queendom far over the horizon. Strangely, it felt like an afterthought. She put the manometer back in her bag, along with her notebook. He's weird with money, isn't he? If someone overcharged him five times the fair price, I bet he'd apologize and pay it, she whispered. Not even kidding. That's basically how my salary was agreed upon, and it's not normal even for other fancy folk. Some of my family worked for nobles back in Jagged, and they were the stingiest, most demanding jerks you'd ever meet. They continued through the forest toward town. I meant the nobles, he clarified. Taritha hadn't spent much time with Ricard before, but it was impossible not to smile around him. Part of her worried she couldn't keep up with him, since he always was cracking on about something, but thankfully he didn't seem to expect her to. Yeah, Mage Thippoli isn't what I expected. Not that I really knew what to expect. Do you think the town will go along with his big plan? she said, intoning the last two words with gravitas. The road passed near some outlying cottages, and Teresa stopped, quickly taking a reading and jotting down the results. She was getting better at being quicker and more subtle with the artifact. This town? No question. Have you not been to the pub lately? They toast to him more than they do to the light, their count or their own wives. Don't underestimate just how much the town has changed. I grew up here. They hate things that don't match their beliefs. If they knew the truth, you guys are going to earn every glindy of your salary the day that gets out, Teresa said. Me too, for that matter. His helm scraped his shoulder pauldrons as he shook his head. Nah, he's done the hard work, won their trust. Everything else is easy. She shook her head but didn't reply. He didn't know these people. Obviously no one would talk about their true reactions to some out-of-towner in front of another out-of-towner. You don't believe me, do you? He said as they reached the trade district. She took another reading, smooth and quick. She didn't even think Rickard saw the emeralds that time. I get why you think what you do, she said diplomatically. There was an old woman in her garden, just on the other side of the low fence they were walking by. 
She was mostly skin and bones and old enough to be either of their grandmothers. She knelt in her garden, pulling weeds in the midday sun, wearing an old patched dress with a wide straw hat. Excuse me, Gran. Do you mind if I ask you something? Ricard asked politely, taking off his helm to make eye contact. Huh, sure, anything for you. Her voice was gravelly but clear. She stopped what she was doing and sat back on her bum. Her face was weathered and flushed from exertion. Would you consider the mage that moved here this spring a good thing for the town? He spoke evenly, trying not to bias her answer. Mage Thippily is his name. You ought to know that, we're in his tabard and all. Best thing that's happened to this town in my life, ever. I spent six years in bed, couldn't walk, just waiting to go into the light. Now I feel like a teenager again. He fixed my back, he fixed my skin, fixed it all. I'm eighty-eight years old and I've been gardening all day. I'm glad to hear it. He's a great man and we are both honoured to work for him. He nodded and started putting his helm back on. The floodgates were open and she wasn't done. I don't think I don't see you there, Taritha. I got good eyes again. Your creams were a godsend, but now I'm going to live until I'm two hundred. That mage couldn't do anything wrong, not if he tried. That's incredible, ma'am, thank... Ricard started. If he needs to eat babies, I'll round up some for him. I ain't got a shortage of useless great-grandbabies. Shadows below. If he wants to pump a few babies into me, he's welcome to them. That's very much not the... Ricard said, slowly backing away, grateful for the low fence between them. Or did he send me his strapping young man to do the job? By now she was standing with a mostly toothless grin, leaning over her fence. Ricard backpedaled more quickly. Fine, be like that, but tell him that Abby Grain is here for him. Will do, Gran. Have a good day now. They walked quickly down the road to put some distance between them and the amorous oldster. I see. I may have misjudged the effect of helping people, Taritha said, stifling a giggle. Ricard chuckled, adjusting the chin strap on his helm. I told you, he won more than just their trust. <laughs>